we are working our way through basic assumptions that one needs in order to understand international trade. And we have till now made three assumptions, the first one being rationality and perfect knowledge. The second assumption we have made is we are looking at two by two by two world. And the third assumption we have made is absence of money illusion. And this is what we are working on. And as I had explained in my previous video, absence of money illusion simply means that consumers or producers make their decisions based on real rather than nominal variables. And in the last video, what I had done was I had distinguished between what is nominal income and what is real income. What is nominal income once again? It's the amount of money you earn as in dollars. And what is real income? Real income is nominal income adjusted for price level. So real income in a way gives you consumption or production choices available to an economic age. Now last time we had used an example about a consumer called John and this person earns $5 income and spends his entire income on clothing and food and we had assumed price of clothing is $1 and price of food is $1 as well and this person saves or borrows nothing Based on this, what we had done was we had made an exhaustive list of consumption choices available to this person. Based on our exhaustive list of consumption choices available to this person, what we had done was we had drawn a budget line. We already know the meaning of the budget line. And let's call this situation one where the income of John is $5 and price of clothing and price of food equals $1. So this is how we had drawn budget line one. And now what we'll do is we'll change his financial circumstances and, and draw different budget lines and compare them to this budget line one. Now suppose John income doubles, that is, from $5, his income increases to $10. And we still hold all other things the same. That is price of clothing and price of food is still $1 a unit. And rest of the assumptions are still the same. And based on these new numbers, when John's nominal income is $10 and price of clothing equals price of food equals $1, we can create a table like we had done earlier and what this table will indicate is an exhaustive list of consumption choices available to John. For example, look at consumption choice A. Suppose John decides to buy no clothing. In that case, he has $10 to spend on food and price of each unit of food is $1. So what's max amount of food he can buy? It'll be 10. Look at another point like B. Suppose John decides to buy one unit of clothing. He has spent $1 on clothing. He is left with $9 out of $10 income. And since the price of food is $1, he can buy nine units of food. And in this way, we complete this table. And this gives us an exhaustive list of consumption choices available to John. Now, what I have done is on this diagram, what we have are two budget lines. This blue one is our original budget line, which we have called BL1. And what is this based on? This is based on John's income being $5, price of clothing being $1, and price of food being $1. Now, this red line is what we call budget line 2. And what is this based on? This is based on consumption choices that we had listed on the previous table. And here, nominal income of John is $10 and price of clothing equals price of food, which stays the same in both these situations. It's still $1. So we have a new budget line 
called BL2. Now compare BL2 to BL1. Which line would indicate more consumption choices? It will obviously be budget line 2, which will indicate more consumption choices. And more consumption choices a person has, we know it means higher real income. So in this case, budget line 2 implies higher real income relative to budget line 1. And when has this happened? When price of both goods have stayed the same and John's nominal income has doubled. Now let us look at another situation. John's income is the same as it was under BL1, which is $5. And price of unit of clothing has now fallen from $1 to $0.50, cents, or price of clothing has fallen. And price of food still stays the same. So based on these new financial numbers, what we do is, again, we write down an exhaustive list of consumption choices available to John when his income is $5, price of food is $1, and price of clothing is now $0.50. Cents. Again, look at consumption choice A. John decides to spend no money on clothing. What's the max amount of food he can buy? When price of food is $1, he can buy 5 units of food. Look at choice 2. Suppose John decides to buy two units of clothing. That means he has spent $1 on clothing. He's left with $4. And so what is the max amount of food he can buy? It will be four units. And in this way, we have constructed an exhaustive list of consumption choices available to John under new financial situation. Once again, we compare the situation presented on the previous table. Let's call that situation three. And so this green line indicates that situation 3, and this is the budget line which corresponds to that, or we can call it BL3. What is this based on? BL3 is based on John's nominal income being $5, price of clothing being $0.50, cents, and price of food being $1. And then we have our original budget line, and you already know the financial configuration of budget line 1. Now, price of clothing has fallen. Everything else has stayed the same. But look at these two budget lines. What can you say about consumption choices available to John under BL3 relative to BL1? And what you find here is, under BL3, John has more consumption choices relative to BL1. Or in other words, real income of John is much higher under BL3 relative to BL1. And why has this happened? Simply because only one item has become cheaper, that is clothing, and rest of the things stay the same. Now keep situation one in the background and now look at a new situation. John still earns the same nominal income, which is $5. Price of clothing is 50 cents. But now price of food increases to $2.50. So what has happened as compared to situation one? Clothing has become relatively cheaper and food has become relatively more expensive. And the way we have been doing it, the same way we can construct this table, which gives us an exhaustive list of consumption choices available to John. For example, point A, John decides to spend no money on clothing. So John is left with $5 to spend on food. Now how much does food cost? It costs $2.50. So what's the max amount of food he can buy? It will be two units. Look at choice B. Suppose John decides to buy five units of clothing. Each unit of clothing costs 50 cents. And so he has spent $2.50 on clothing. And out of his income of $5, he's left with $2.50. And price of food is $2.50. So what's the max of food he can buy? It'll be one unit. And in this way, we can write down choice C. Based on our situation for the previous table, we can draw 
budget line 4, this orange color line, which we call BL4. And we know the financial configuration of BL4. Income is still $5. Price of clothing is $0.50. Cents, and price of food is $2.50. And the blue line is still budget line one. We know the financial configuration of this one. Income is $5. Price of food equals price of clothing, which is $1. Now question arises, in this case, how do we compare real income implied by BL4 relative to BL1? The way to do this is you have to figure out the area implied by area of the triangle implied by BL4 and compare it to area of the triangle implied by BL1. If you do this calculation, what you'll find is the area of the triangle under BL1 is greater than the area of the triangle under BL4 and thus BL1 implies higher real income relative to BL4. And this is how we make comparisons and make judgment about real income between two. Now a question arises, how do we calculate real income in a real world situation when we spend money on not just one or two items, but hundreds of different items? And uh, to help us with this, the statisticians have come up with what is called a price index number. It's just number one number and what it reflects is average level of prices relevant to a typical economic agent. So you work out some kind of a weighted average and you have one number for hundreds of different items. There are two popular price index numbers. One is CPI or consumer price index and what this is supposed to reflect is average level of prices relevant to a typical consumer. Another popular price index number is producer price index or PPI in short. And what this reflects is average level of prices relevant to a typical producer. We use the following formula to calculate real income in a real world setting. And this formula is real income equals nominal income divided by the relevant price index number. And this whole ratio times 100 will give us real income. Now let us look at the following examples and calculate real income. Suppose in 1990 my annual income was $10,000 and the CPI was 200. What will be my no uh, real income in 1990? It will be my nominal income which is 10,000 divided by price index number which is 200 this ratio times 100 and this gives me $5,000. That will be my real income. Now in 2010 my nominal income increased tenfold and it became 100,000 and the CPI in 2010 was say 3,000. What was my real income in 2010? 100,000 divided by the price index number which is 3,000. This ratio times 100 and this gives us the following real income. And what we find is, though in nominal terms, my, my income had increased tenfold, in terms of what I can buy, there has been a decline in my standard of living. And so these kind of comparisons we can make in real world situations. So this completes our discussion of the assumption of absence of money illusion. And we've worked through different examples, that is of one good case, two good case, and the real world situation as to how we calculate real income. And once again, what is absence of money illusion? It is simply that economic agents make decisions based on real rather than nominal variables. Thank you for your time.